Newcastle Police Rescue put aside time each month to hone their skills with practical and theoretical tests. This cliff rescue is a rehearsal for something that happens rarely, but that makes it all the more important for officers to be prepared. The training day is normally something that we don't... The things that we don't come up against every day, like there'd be no point in going out and, and training on motor vehicle extrication because 70% of our job is already doing that. Police Rescue also work closely with other rescue groups, especially those formed in the industrial sector. Members of the Grain Handling Authority and BHP rescue units took part in today's cliff exercise. The police would like to see more businesses, especially those involved in heavy industry, committed to rescue training. Constable Alan Woodham says police rescue are ready to assist in an emergency, but often inside knowledge of an industrial site can be a lifesaver. Forming a rescue crew is only too easy. It's only a matter of contacting us. Uh, we sit down and uh, with their uh, employers or their own union and uh, show them what we can do. And if they're interested, we can set up set up their training program and uh, help them in any way we can. This exhibition reflects very much the new wave of young artists who are just now making a name for themselves in the United Kingdom. They are considered the cream of the talent to emerge this decade. Most of the painters are in their 20s and 30s. The exhibition shows the range and power of painting surfacing in Britain. Many are imaginative paintings of personal and poetic fantasy. A number of the works are by a new wave of Scottish artists. They are powerful linear works that reflect a peculiarly Scottish outlook on life. According to Patsy Zeppel of the British Council in Australia, the exhibition shows a range of works rarely seen here. I suppose it's representing a much more European imagination of people living in large crowded cities. You certainly see that in the Scottish painters, don't you? Yeah, they seem a little bit dark, perhaps a bit depressing. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know. What they, they're more concerned perhaps with slightly more political issues, or different political issues anyway. At 25, hey, Michael yeah. Jones has won the National yeah. Beach Flags title seven times, the last six consecutively. The Lake Macquarie Beach Inspector is a member of the Redhead Club and won the World Beach Flags title in 1981. At the last World Championships in 1983, Mike could only manage third after tripping. On Thursday, he heads for the Gold Coast, where he hopes to win back that world title. Mike's domination of the beach flags for so long is the result of a perfect technique in the event that requires agility, strength, speed and quick thinking. We developed a technique of getting up uh, years ago with my coaches, the Bale brothers, and, uh, and it's, it's really paid off. It seems to be uh, a great advantage uh, and to get in front on the run. You've already got one world championship uh, and a third. Can you make that two world titles this weekend? I, I really hope so. I, I badly want it. Uh, it'd be a great finale. I'd like to go out on top uh, and I'll be trying my hardest. Another local expected to do well at the World Championships is Guy Andrews. Last weekend he became the first Newcastle competitor to ever win an Australian Ironman title when he took out the junior event. On the Gold Coast he'll have to compete in open company but is still confident of making the final and finishing in the top four. of a war or what's called a low-level conflict, Bayswater Power Station along with several other industrial centres would be on the enemy's hit list in a hunter. For the Army Reserve it's the ideal scenario for the training exercise. The ground plan is that the brigade is deployed to cover like an enemy objectives which have been identified. These number several such as Bayswater Power Station, Eldersley Bridge, uh, uh, Glen Nevis Landing Grounds and the old Paxton Colliery Ruins. 
In the past, the Army Reserve has been peripheral to the so-called regulars, but now under the Defence White Paper strategy released last year, they are a vital component of any mainland defence. The exercise in the Hunter involves more than 1,000 troops, mainly from the 4-3 and 119 Royal New South Wales regiments. They're supported by armoured personnel carriers from the district's own Hunter River Lancers. The enemy is played by a raider battalion of regular troops from Townsville. For the Army Reserve, an important aspect is a boost in public prestige. Instead of conducting seemingly irrelevant training exercises in isolated bushland, they are now working in the community, demonstrating their new role as part of the defence network. There's a great uh, rapport being established between the local population and the Army now because they can see that we're doing a real-life task and it's uh, valuable for us to be seen in that role. What about the uh, general reaction from the troops? Do they find it a, a different uh, scenario and a more satisfying one? I think so. Uh, uh, they can relate to the real task. In fact, a lot of the troops are from this local area, particularly from the 12th, 16th Hunter River Lancers. They uh, operate in this area and they live in this area. What about the scale of the operation? How does it uh, compare to others? Uh... Jack Peters owns and runs the old farm nursery at Madawi. He's one of a number of property owners on the Georgetown Road who already have an Elcom transmission line running through their properties. But Elcom has plans to upgrade the Tari to Tomago line. It has decided to construct a new line between South Madawi and Tomago. It was going to pull down the old line, but has decided instead to give it to the Shortland County Council for its use. This means that there will now be two lines running parallel. Farmers like Jack Peters are not at all happy with the plan. He says extra land will be needed for the lines and it will make using machinery in the paddock very difficult. He's unhappy with the $5,000 worth of compensation offered by Elcom and estimates that he will lose between $5,000 to $10,000 in revenue each year because of the new line. But this is not the only issue. Jack Peters recently held a public meeting for people affected by the new line. He says a number of concerns were raised, including fears about the health effects of the electromagnetic field emanating from the wires. A spokesman from Elcom speaking from Sydney said rerouting the line would simply be too costly. He said if residents were not happy with the compensation offered, they were welcome to get an independent valuation. Elcom was also willing to discuss with them the health effects of the electromagnetic fields. Investors, both small and large, got burnt in last October's stock market crash. A good proportion in Newcastle had invested through the internationally recognised Sydney-based firm Bain & Company. Last night Bain & Company held a seminar for its clientele to update them on the current state of the Australian economy and their investments. Chief economist for the firm, Dr Don Stammer, told the gathering the worst was over and there is no reason why the Australian economy should continue to improve. The Australian economy may slow a little in the the next 12 months, but there won't be a recession. The share market crash has done a lot less damage to the real economy than most people thought. We expect a little further recovery in the Australian share market, and we do expect interest rates to fall further over the next few months. And will the change of government at a state level have much impact on those predictions? Uh, the change of government in New South Wales will not alter the mood of the federal government, which is to introduce quite a large surplus in its budget, and that is very, very good news for interest rates. It, it uh, increases the prospects that interest rates can fall. What the change of government in New South Wales probably does is increase the pressure on Mr Keating to reduce personal taxes in his May economic statement. Right. And uh, do you think people uh, had much reason to... The growing problem of drug abuse has prompted many educational programs aimed generally at discouraging younger people from partaking. Many adults, however, have little experience of how to recognise and deal with drugs, especially in their children, and so last night a forum was held to better inform them. 
The forum, a first for Newcastle, was initiated by Adamstown Police in conjunction with neighbourhood watch groups in the Adamstown, Katara and New Lambton areas. The gathering heard from experts in the drug field, including Detective Sergeant Morris Dewan from the Drug Law Enforcement Bureau, Major Stan Hindle of the Salvation Army and Raoul Walsh, Drug Coordinator for the Hunter Region Health Department. Sergeant Cole Manuel from Adamstown Police says most middle-aged people grew up not knowing about illegal drugs. I think it's a genuine fear throughout the uh, community from parents uh, as far as illegal drugs are concerned and uh, I think the, we do need education in this area. And Sergeant Manuel says there's no reason the idea behind last night's forum can't be expanded. Hopefully if tonight is a success, uh, we're hoping that uh, so the likes of Walls End or Belmont Divisions could, uh, could look at running a similar type forum and also we could look at running uh, future forums for different subjects such as underage drinking or, or uh, similar type subjects as that. Successive governments have been notorious for not sticking to promises made at election time. But the Newcastle Chamber of Commerce wants to ensure that the state government does not break its commitment to establishing an independent port authority for Newcastle. They are waiting until Nick Griner swears in his new ministry tomorrow and then plan to lobby in earnest. According to Chamber of Commerce President Peter Rundle, the port of Newcastle will benefit a great deal from an independent authority. We see it being essential to the future development of the Port of Newcastle in terms of uh, creating traffic through the port and uh, creating jobs. Uh, we estimate somewhere between five and ten million dollars a year goes out of the Port of Newcastle into general revenues and subsidising uh, other ports such as Wollongong. So why is that so bad? The is also keen to see Mr Griner implement his promise for a minister for the Hunter. The Liberal Party recognise that the Hunter is a very important economic region in Australia. It's more important than the whole of Tasmania and I think that uh, by virtue of its importance it needs that proper representation. But it appears the Chamber will already be disappointed on this score. You've heard me say previously that the performance of the Griner local Labor Party no members portfolio. with respect to the submarine... The blue booklet contains sections for recording childhood illnesses, clinical health problems, immunisations and height and weight. It will also record drug allergies, behavioural problems and contains useful information on first aid and child development. This is the first time in New South Wales that a child's entire medical history would be in one place and readily accessible. It's already been a great success in New Zealand and South Australia and could prove valuable for people travelling overseas. However, with the booklet comes the warning that it must be kept current to be of value. It's very dependent on the people involved using it. There's no compulsion or anything like that. Uh, so we would ask that parents take the book along when they go to visit the baby clinic sister or the family doctor and then ask the doctor to uh, write in it appropriately. We would also ask the doctors and the baby clinic nurses to do their part too and, and ask the parents for it if they've forgotten. Greg Bray is 33 years old and looking for a job. Recently retrenched from BHP, he's decided it's time for a career change and so have 17 other unemployed members of the Cardiff Workers Club aged between 21 and 55. With the help of Mike Hamill, a vocational counsellor with the Department of Industrial Relations and Employment, the group has spent the past three days going through the job finding drill writing job applications, preparing for personal and telephone interviews and presenting resumes are now skills which have been tightly tucked under the belt of the prospective employees. For most, the scheme has helped in many ways. I'm a transport driver and uh, I'm finding it very hard to find work. And I've been applying for jobs, but I didn't know how, I wasn't doing it right. Um, I had no qualifications in applying for work 
so I'd never had to do it. I feel more confident now than what I was before and I feel that I could go out there now, I could apply for a job and I need to have no fear of being turned down. Job Search 88 was the idea of management staff at the Cardiff Workers' Club. The program is the club's bicentennial contribution to the community. Although only club members are eligible to apply, the scheme will continue throughout the year. We expect it to run for the, to, to the end of the year. Uh, it's, we're not sure just how many we'll have, but probably about one a month, we hope. For Iona, a new job would help her life to begin at 40. Well, when an employer finds out how old I am, they don't want to know anymore. I Really, I don't know why, because I'm 40 years of age, and I think I work just as well as anybody else that's younger, if not better. I saw the truck coach, it was opening in the bank and I saw it coming over here, but truck drivers usually pull in on this side of the road to get a paper off me, but I noticed there was no one in it and it hit the gutter and I just took off up the street. <laughs> 